Okay, recording in progress. Let me hide the meeting controls. And um, here we are. Let's see, that works. Okay, so good morning. Uh, happy Wednesday. Uh, it is so called, oh, is that word? Hump day. Um, I still don't understand that because camels can have two humps. Anyways, um, but today uh, is lab day. And Wednesday marks now three weeks, that was fast, um, into the semester. And so today we'll spend the time going over a uh, solution to project number two. Thank you to all of your uh, submissions um, last night slash uh, this morning. And what I'll do is uh, break out the sketch pad. Oh no, it's back. Uh, and put you in the mind space of the solution. Uh, and then we'll go through a Jupyter notebook uh, with um, a solution. And I stress a solution and not the solution, as there are many different ways uh, that you can solve this problem. Uh, but before I begin, some of the administrative bits, the usual. Um, the reading has changed. Um, I've curated a pretty nice book. There's a Google Doc out there that I've linked to in the course resources section of the Moodle site. And we will be pivoting and continuing on Friday with other formalisms uh, building towards so-called Bayesian um, statistics, uh, an important uh, mathematical tool uh, in data science and in general. And um, I forgot the other thing I was going to say. I actually had to speak with a colleague this morning when I usually do some other review. Um, it's, it's, yes, yes, okay, office hours, my office hours today are uh, gonna be truncated. They're usually Wednesdays, uh, 10.30 to 12.30, um, but I have a faculty meeting at uh, 12 and I have to interview a faculty candidate for the math department at 2.30, and then I have another meeting at three. I remember, um, you know, I started out in industry and in the beginning, I wanted nothing to do with academia, so why am I here, right? That's another story for another time. Um, but um, they never told me how much other stuff you do as a professor, right? And so this is some of that other stuff. We're enterprising to hire uh, two more faculty in the computer science department. Uh, so there's a lot of work done in terms of reading all of the application packages, organizing Zoom calls for candidates and interviewing them and coordinating schedules to get them on campus and all that good stuff, as well as other committee work, uh, assisting and running various important administrative uh, duties uh, in the university. So that's the other stuff they don't tell you about. And I remember when I first uh, became a faculty member at my previous institution, um, I called my advisor one of them and said, why didn't you tell me that there's all this other stuff, right? Um, so I'm happy to talk about that with you um, if you are hoping someday to become a faculty member. And faculty members come from some of the strangest places. So you might think I want nothing to do with academia, just as I thought back then, I thought I was gonna be an industry titan um, and uh, stay in industry, but here I am. So um, you never know, you, know, you might get that calling, so to speak, at some point, uh, in your career. Uh, so I don't test you on the reading. The deadlines are there uh, for your pacing. And, you know, my daughter is pretty sick. Uh, she woke up sick Monday morning, and the usual vomiting, low grade fever, sore throat, all that stuff. Uh, so at your own risk, if you'd like to come to office hours, I'm going to wear my mask as I, you know, more so out of an abundance of caution. But I'll certainly post, I think I have already, my Zoom meeting room, if you choose to do office hours by that modality, you're welcome to if you choose not to go to the physical office hours. And more generally, I'm happy to arrange office hours outside of my office hours um, so that we can kind of think of a mutually agreeable time that fits both our schedules. And I can do that via Zoom or just uh, chatting. Question. Uh, she's getting better. Thank you for asking. She's getting better. You know, as a parent, you kind of deal with that stuff. You know, when I was uh, single, I used to say, ooh, vomit, right? Now you get used to it, right? So um, that being said, thank you for asking. She's getting better. She's enjoying not going to school. I shouldn't say that, but she's enjoying not going to school for now the third day. All right. Any any questions? No questions? No? All right. Um, so why don't we jump right in? So today, um, we're going to kind of use the 
uh, screen here, this sketch pad, I'll pick blue, uh, to put you in the mind space of the solution to the problem. And so here we have um, your computer, and I'm just gonna draw a disassociated uh, disc. And this drum represents your disc. You can imagine platters and cylinders, and you have all uh, new all data, new all data, and it's a CSV file. Now, as a CSV file on disk, it consists of two portions, and I'm still getting used to drawing on this thing this semester. You have your headers, which consists of a comma-separated list of strings, and this comma-separated list is used uh, as a set of labels for all of the stuff that occurs in the data portion. So this would be our data portion. And in our case, our first field for the header is the date. And I can't remember the order for the others, but you have broccoli, um, spaghetti, I think it was Chuck, and tomato, right? The four food items. And so this is a mixed CSV file. Uh, the date is going to be a string. And then each one of these food items is going to have an entry uh, that is a floating point number or you could think of it as a real number. And so here we have our first entry and our first entry is going to have a label in that month year format. So you're gonna have January, 2012. And I'm not gonna draw all of them. I'll just use the uh, teacher's ellipses uh, that I used to hate when I was in your position. And it's gonna end with a date string of December, 20. 20. And we're going to have all the other, oops, if I can draw correctly, other labels. And then we're going to have our numbers here 1.2, 2.0. I'm just making these numbers up 3.7 and 1.6 um, for each one of the food items. Now, one of the things to pay attention to is that when you store it on disk and read it into memory uh, with uh, the CSV reader, each one of these items is treated as text. And as text in particular, when you grab one of these numbers, that's gonna be, for example, the string 1.6, and you have to convert it to the numeral or the floating point value 1.6. And we'll comment on that um, in the Jupyter notebook. Okay, any questions? No? All right, so the first order of business then is to take this CSV file, off of the disk and bring it into memory. So I'm going to draw aspects of our von Neumann architecture. And this is your random access memory or your memory. And we need to bring it into memory. And so how we're going to do that is with first the file open. And file open locates on disk the cylinders and the platters and the sectors and tracks and all that good stuff. Takes that and returns back a reference so that the system knows where to go in order to retrieve that data. And then we wrap a CSV reader around it. And that reader says, this isn't just an arbitrary stream of bits on the disk. Um, this particular sequence of bits should be interpreted in a particular way, right? And that's a comma separated set of values in table format where you have a set of rows one at a time. And so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take this on disk data structure, our CSV, and we read it into memory. And if you're gonna read it into memory, you need to store it someplace. So you're gonna need a data structure to do that. Now you're gonna use a two dimensional array. Um, and when we talk about data frames, you can do it in just one fell swoop, one API call. But part of project number two is again, to continue refreshing your practice with Python, but to give you an appreciation for all of the things uh, that the data frame in the Pandas API and Python is doing for you. Okay, so we start out with an array, and that array is initially going to be empty, and I should draw that array like this. Let me do this array. It's going to be empty, and then one at a time, we're going to populate it with rows from this table from this CSV, dot, 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 and there's our last row. And so we're gonna need an array, and each time we retrieve 
the first row, the second row, the third row, et cetera, onto the nth row in the CSV file, we're going to populate that row as an array added to subsequent positions in what began as a 1D array. And again, underneath the covers, the implementation of a 2D array is nothing more than a one-dimensional array where in each position is an object, which is itself uh, an array. Okay. Any questions? That makes sense? Yeah. So now let's go to the next slide, get a clean slate. Let's imagine you have your array in memory and it's a 2D array. And I'll just draw it this way. And then I'll draw it again as something that just looks like a table. Now, of course, when we build this array, we just want the numbers in uh, this table because we're not going to use the labels when we do our visualization. And so let's assume here we have each entry are the rows of this array. And this is just a schematic of what the array looks like. We have each row is the first reporting period, the second reporting period, up to the 108th reporting period. It's 108 reporting periods because we have 12 months and we have nine years, nine times 12 uh, is 108. And so the first thing we wanna do, we wanna plot each one of the food items. We wanna plot that in time as a line plot. So we have broccoli, chuck, um, I think it was spaghetti and tomato. I'll get the order when I look at the Python notebook. And we want to extract each one of these columns worth of data from our table after we built it up row by row from the CSV file so that we can put them in individual vectors in order to plot them uh, in our line plot. And we can also compute our summary statistics from those same vectors. Okay. Any questions? No? Make sense? All right. So now, how do we do that? Well, slicing gives us the opportunity to do that. And we could certainly do that natively, um, but I'm going to take this and wrap it in NumPy because NumPy affords us some API calls that are a little bit cleaner, uh, a little bit nicer. And so we're going to say, go ahead and take this Python array, convert it to a NumPy array, and then we're going to slice the first column, the second column, the third column, and the fourth column. And so here, if I say array slice notation, I use the wildcard, a colon. Let's recall the slicing notation. It has a start index, colon, and a stop index. If you leave out one, the other, or both, um, Python is going to substitute for the start a zero, which is the smallest start location, and length minus one, which is the largest uh, stop index for the array slice. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? And so we're going to pick out broccoli, which is the, I'm sorry, it's not the zeroth, it's the first position. No, I'm sorry, it's the zeroth position. I'll explain what I mean by that, why that is. And for Chuck, in this case, it's going to be array, wildcard slice on the rows, because we're going to go first row through 108th row, um, with uh, Chuck in this scheme, schematic, uh, for spaghetti. You're going to array slice over all the rows. The second position, 0, 1, 2. And then for tomato, you're going to do a slice array over all the rows with 3 as the column. Okay. Any questions? Does that make sense? No? No questions? All right. And so once we do that, we can certainly give these names. Uh, we could give this first one a name like broccoli prices. We could give this second one something like Chuck prices. We could give this third one spaghetti. How does abbreviate prices? So I don't embarrass myself with the misspelling. And then this last one, we're going to call it, oops, tomato. I'll abbreviate that prices. So now going forward, we can produce our line plots from these arrays, broccoli prices, Chuck, spaghetti prices, tomato prices. Uh, we can compute histograms. Uh, we can do all sorts of things, including uh, computing uh, our summary statistics. Okay, any questions? So we load from disk into memory, um, recast it as a NumPy array, 
uh, we do the slicing, uh, and then we can then traffic in these individual pricing arrays to do our analyses, including the correlation coefficient. Okay, question. Um, you could do it as an individual array. I just like to do it as a NumPy array um, because I, for me, it's, it's more pleasing visually to have uh, the array access as comma separated instead of doing them as separate um, square braces. But it's not incorrect to do it otherwise. You could also, instead of slicing, you could iterate through each column's worth of data and in each time append to a Python array that particular measurement. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Okay. Um, if this were sort of a computer science course and we were thinking about engineering considerations, one of the things that we would concern ourselves with is the um, implication on the amount of memory that gets used up as well as the performance uh, that, uh, that uh, is associated. Uh, but that's not 100% the consideration for this class. But I'll certainly comment sometimes on practices that are more memory efficient or more um, conducive to faster performance. And that matters when you're dealing with much larger data sets. Um, there's one assignment where we'll deal with large-ish data sets, but we're not going to deal with, um, you know, 500 gigabyte data sets and things like that, like satellite imagery and things like that. Any other questions? No? No other questions? Okay. So let me pop out of PowerPoint here. And every time... I exit the share for PowerPoint. It always um, kills the share for other stuff. So I'm just gonna reshare all the things I intended to share. All right, so let me do this, screen share. So we'll bring up our Jupyter Notebook and I'll direct your attention. Uh, there's this command line window. Let me blow that up a little bit. And if I do PWD, see I've already gone to that path in my file system. Mac OS is um, Berkeley Systems Division or BSD Unix underneath the covers with a little bit of something called the Mac OS, uh, microkernel services. Um, but you see there the path uh, to uh, a location, Jupyter Notebooks at the top level um, in the file system, or I should say if you're traversing the tree at the leaves of the tree. Um, Jupyter Notebooks, I like to collect together all of my Jupyter work in one location, right? And so if I do an LS here, you can see a bunch of files there, Project 2 Visualization Solution and all new data.csv. Uh, since we're here in the file system, let's take a look at all new data.csv. And that's the result, or new all data new all data. That's the result of the solution uh, to project number one. And as you can see, it's a mixed uh, CSV file. Uh, the first row is the header row. It has strings, and these strings connote uh, the variable names uh, for the data that follows uh, in the columns. And so one of the things we need to do when we move through or iterate uh, through this CSV file, we want to retrieve uh, this header file uh, and we don't want to add that to that table for the all data because this header is just descriptive and isn't one of the actual data containing entries that we're going to use in our table. Moreover, we also don't want the date, right? That first column's uh, data is a string, it's descriptive, but we know that first measurement uh, in our table, that first row, um, or in Python, the zeroth row, um, once we get all the data, um, is that zeroth column, I should say, is going to be just a label that is a descriptor for the measurement, that first measurement, January 2012, all the way to that last measurement, uh, December 2020. And so we also don't want to have that string uh, corresponding to the month and date, uh, that measurement interval. We don't want that in our data because we're not going to plot that. Certainly, you could use that as a type of label along your horizontal axis, uh, not required to, uh, but you could certainly do that. And there are variations on the APIs to have labels for each one of the tick marks um, on your X axis or horizontal axis. Okay, any questions? No questions, no? And so the other file of interest is this project two um, IPython file. 
that's your Jupyter notebook and it's not a text file, right? And I'll show it's not a text file. I have to make sure not to edit it. Now, a Jupyter notebook has all of the information, including the graphics and formatting corresponding uh, to your Jupyter. And it's a type of representation called JSON, JavaScript Object Notation, which is a so-called serialized version or written out as sequential text uh, representation of all of the stuff you see drawn or rendered by your browser. And so when you change things in your Jupyter Notebook, you're changing something in your JSON, and it also has some binary information or can have binary information. If we go back up, what came whooshing by, Whoops, where where to go? Uh, control D. Let's see. You can see uh, what looks like. Um, let's see. There we go. Uh, what just looks like someone took some characters and just kind of vomited it out onto the screen. Uh, that's binary. Uh, some binary representation for something, right? Uh, it looks like uh, the contents of of an image. And so you're going to see a lot of places that look like that, and you can absolutely uh, bring up a binary file format uh, in your editor, but you don't want to make any changes to that because uh, you'll effectively corrupt uh, that binary information. So that's a Jupyter Notebook, and it's a file on your file system, and it gets created whenever you create a notebook uh, in uh, the Jupyter Lab system. Okay, any questions? No? All right. So let's bring it up, Jupyter Lab. And one of the things I'll point out is you'll notice here on my command line prompt, there's a prefix uh, that says base. That's the environment that I'm using in Anaconda. Base is the default. I could certainly set or create a new environment, a named uh, collection of tools and Python versions and things like that, and use that if my project warranted it. All right. So the first thing you do is you activate that particular environment. And on at least Mac OS, when you install Anaconda, every time you bring up a terminal window, it automatically sets to that default base environment. Okay, any questions? No? All right. So let's, without further ado, let's bring up uh, Jupyter Lab. And so when you do that, it runs the server, uh, which gives you the behavior of your Jupyter Notebook, and then it pops up your default browser. So if you change your default browser uh, to, at least on Mac, from Safari to, say, Firefox, it'll bring up Firefox or Microsoft Edge or whichever platform you're on. Okay, so let me go ahead and let me create a new share so that this Jupyter Notebook um, is visible on the recording. And let me maximize that. And we will... Uh, go over uh, a solution, uh, not necessarily uh, the uh, solution. All right, hide meeting controls. So we start out, and the general format I like to adopt, this is just stylistic. There's nothing wrong with doing it otherwise. But the general stylized um, format I like to use is in the top of my program, I typically alphabetize uh, the inclusion of libraries and modules that I'm gonna use uh, in my project. And then um, I follow that with the constants uh, that are useful uh, in my program. And then I follow that with the data structures that I use in my program. And then I follow that uh, by uh, the functions, the helper functions that I implement that I need for my project. And then lastly, if I had a main routine, something running in the debugger like PyCharm, I have my main entry point. Okay, now it's not incorrect to write it differently. Uh, one of the things I found when I was in industry as a research scientist in distributed systems R&D uh, for eight years before going back for my PhD, um, I found that when you're working in large groups, if you adopt a type of schema or pattern or style, it makes it much easier uh, to read the code of your colleagues and both present and past. Uh, very few times you will get to in practice uh, create brand new code from scratch most of the time in the wild, be that industry, be that government, uh, be that other places, you're going to be using code um, that was already in existence. You're going to be modifying existing code. So it's really nice to adopt a schema because people know what to expect. They know where to expect it. Um, okay, so we start out and we're going to import a bunch of things. We're going to use CSV library, going to use the math library. And the math library, if you Google search it, it has things for computing stuff like summary statistics, uh, like averages, like mean, 
no, that's not right. Uh, like uh, mean, like min, max, and all sorts of useful things uh, mathematically. Um, the matplotlib, I import pyplot and I give it a, a mnemonic, a name, shorter name, plot. Um, you don't have to use plot, that method. Uh, it just um, allows you uh, the ability to do less typing when you're uh, writing your code, um, more of a convenience. I'm gonna import NumPy uh, because those particular additional APIs on top of Python arrays are very, very useful. And as I alluded to before, um, I like their slicing notation better because for a 2D array, I like to show you within that comma separated list what the slice um, uh, commands are. Um, also statistics, I use that for standard deviation and for the mean. Uh, you could certainly implement it yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you could choose to use other libraries to compute that. Uh, when we show the use of pandas, pandas associates with their objects, the so-called data frame that we'll learn, um, various types of summaries, various types of statistics, and other uh, very useful uh, operations. Okay, any questions? No? Right. Make sense? All right, so we do that and we go down here and this is another stylistic thing. Um, I like to have uh, very verbose programs when they run, um, they um, print out a lot of information to the command line. And when you're done uh, running your program and you wanna try variations of it, um, you know, sometimes I like it to be less ver verbose. So a lot of times um, a practice uh, that sort of I've carried over from C and C++ um, is I like to have a global variable, a constant that's either uh, true or false, where every time I'm printing something out, echoing to the screen, I wrap it in a conditional uh, with that particular constant uh, called debug. And so I can effectively turn on and turn off the verbosity because when you're running stuff a large number of times and just trying to tinker with variations, sometimes that verbosity, uh, all those print printouts to the console and it gets in the way of your ability to understand uh, what it's doing. And so certainly printing out is great, stepping through the debugger is great, but being able to turn off all of those debug messages, those print statements uh, is often a useful thing. Okay, so we set that, it's set to be um, less verbose. And we start out and we set up a bunch of file locations to build our path uh, to the all data file, uh, which is on disk in this current directory. And so as we talked about with the file system, Every file system, every directory, a directory is an on-disk data structure, which implements a table. And each entry in that table has three things. It has a name, uh, it has a disk location, disk address, and it has some other information about access and protection. But nonetheless, um, every time you create a directory, uh, by default, there are two directories populating that table, the dot directory and the dot dot directory. The dot directory is a synonym for the current directory and the dot dot directory, uh, if you access it, it's going to bring you to the parent directory of that current directory uh, where you are. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? Yeah, jar your memory. All right, uh, so then of course, after the path we have, for every file system, we have a so-called path separator, and we talked about that. On Unix um, operating systems, it's the forward slash character, which is depicted there. On Windows platforms, it's the backslash character. And you use that path separator in order to separate individual directories um, in your directory tree. And so when I showed you my directory uh, for the command line, it said slash users slash gholeness. That forward slash is how you distinguish between one level in your directory tree and the next level down. Okay, any questions? No, makes sense? All right. So then lastly, we have the name of the file. Now I like to use this type of indirection with my constants because if I wanna target uh, my program to other locations on my file system or from my archive, it's very easy to do that. And the practice of keeping your data file that you need alongside the program guarantees that it requires minimal effort for someone else who might not necessarily be running your operating system uh, to change it quickly in order to run it. Okay, So this is just some 
software engineering practices. It's not incorrect if you don't do it this way. I just thought it'd be useful to mention uh, some good uh, engineering practices. Okay, any questions? No? All right. And so in this next cell, um, I have a bunch of other constants. And these constants I use uh, to pick out the individual columns for the data items uh, in which I'm trafficking once I read them from disk one row at a time from the CSV file. And so I do this because I like to be descriptive. If I'm accessing it, instead of just seeing access column zero, when I slice out that column, if I say access the column called date underscore column, it's a lot more readable, so-called self-documenting code. So that was another important thing I learned in particular at Sun Microsystems. Um, you leave your comments uh, to talk about the steps in your algorithm that your code is trying to accomplish. That is the procedures you're following and what they're doing to the data structures involved. But then when you have other things like the access, try as much as possible to make your code self-documenting. Uh, it makes it much easier uh, to read through uh, for others. Okay. Another global setting that I have is this constant. And I like to, um, they're variables. Uh, but I use the all caps uh, as a note that there's something about this particular variable. It's something that I'm just going to read. It's a constant. And in systems or languages like C++ and C, um, there's a way to do that, something called macros, where you can't change it physically, right? But Python doesn't have that concept. You have to use variables. And so I have histogram bins as another constant, because if I wanted to experiment with the bin count uh, for my histograms when I visualize my distributions, I don't wanna go into five or six or 10 different places in my code to change it. I go up above to this constant and I just change it once and it reflects and updates everywhere I use it. And so using these levels of indirection uh, can uh, make your life a lot easier, especially when we deal with constructing processing pipelines, we're gonna be running different variations of the same stage of processing, uh, it makes it much easier uh, to designate things like different histogram bins. And later on, and we get to processing pipelines, uh, we're going to be setting this uh, from the command line so that you don't even have to go into your code. You just enter in on the command line a different option to your program, and it adjusts appropriately. Okay. Any questions? Does that make sense? Now, your program is Turing complete, right? It'll run. It'll halt. It'll output. Uh, the answer you wanted, it'll do your processing, but, and it's not incorrect computationally to do it otherwise, uh, but you want to, as much as possible, make your life easy um, when you write your code. And it's also good, uh, good engineering practice. Any questions? No, no questions? Still pretty early? Yeah, I hear you. All right. So then we're going to pivot to our data structures. And the data structures I'm going to use called the rows. That's going to contain all of the rows um, called from the CSV file off disk. I have an individual row. And then I have another array uh, called header where I'm going to place the header information. Now, I just got done saying we don't need the header information. That's correct. Um, but I like to hold on to it just in case. OK. Uh, so next, we'll go past that. Um, I guess I lied about the constants that I should have that up above. I go ahead and I build a file path. And so that file path is the directory concatenated as a string with the path separator, concatenated with the file name. So this works on a Mac, but if you want to use this on Windows, all you have to do is go up and change the separator uh, to backslash. Okay. Any questions? No? All right. So let's see, where was I? All right, there, path. And just for good measure, because it gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling. Um, I like to just print out the value of the file path so that I can verify to myself, OK, is it really accessing what I think it is? And so this is an opportunity to kind of show yourself, oh, there's something wrong, right? Um, let the program at various judicious locations in your code show you what it's going to do uh, before it's going to do it. OK. And so the first thing we do is we want to go ahead and instruct the operating system uh, to access that particular entry in that particular directory for the file. And then it's going to spin up your disk, and it's going to move the read-write head to that disk address where the contents of the CSV file is located. And so that's going to be your open. And when you open a file, 
underneath the covers in the operating system, it's returning back an in-memory data structure. And that in-memory data structure maintains a couple things, primarily uh, the location where you are, the offset within that particular file stream, so to speak, uh, on disk. And when you do the file open and the file read, it does not read it in practice one um, byte at a time. It does a bulk data transfer. So it's gonna have a standard block size, uh, maybe um, 40, 96 bytes or something larger. And it's gonna read the entire amount um, on disk, send it across the bus and place it in memory accessed by that particular variable uh, that you assigned it to. And so we do the file open. And when you do the file open, all that your program at that juncture understands about uh, your contents of the file that's now brought into memory um, is that it's a sequence of ones and zeros. So you have to tell it in particular, how do I interpret uh, this sequence of ones and zeros? In our case, we're gonna interpret it as ASCII characters, as text, and this particular sequence of text is gonna be comma separated, terminated by a line feed. Okay, any questions or CSV file? Any questions? No? All right. So we'll go ahead, we open the file, and then we wrap a CSV reader around it. So we call csv.reader, and we give it that particular file pointer or file descriptor, as it's called in Unix, uh, so it knows how to interpret that sequence of ones and zeros as a proper um, formatted CSV file. Now, if physically on disk, we had something that was not a proper CSV file, it's gonna blindly go ahead to CSV reader and interpret it as if it were. So let's say if we just had all the numbers separated by spaces, it's not gonna know that it's separated by spaces unless you tell it that. There are options on the CSV reader to tell it what your so-called delimiter is. The default is comma because it's called comma separated value file format. And so if you didn't do that and underneath the covers, the file on disk was not comma separated, it's gonna consider everything up to the first comma as the first entry in the first line of that particular table, all right? Uh, there's no smarts about it. It does precisely good or bad uh, what it is you ask it to do. All right, any questions? That makes sense? All right. And so the next thing we do is we're gonna, um, I shouldn't say throw away, we're gonna set aside the header and inside the CSV reader, it implements our iterator. It keeps a location or cursor, and it allows you to say, go to the next one. And each time you say, go to the next one, it's gonna fetch the next row's worth of data. And so what does it do? It says, okay, let me look at the line feed. And we talked about line feed when we talked about terminal. And let me take that text between the beginning of the line and that line feed. And everywhere I see a comma, I'm gonna chop it up and populate an entry in array with each one of those um, objects. So we take our iterator in the CSV reader and we call next. And when we call next, it says, okay, go to the next entry, fetching whatever that zeroth entry was, that first row. In our case, uh, that's the header information. Now for good measure, I wanna verify, yeah, is that header information what I thought it was? And yes, it is. It's an array, and that particular array has string objects, and we have date, broccoli, ground truck, spaghetti, and tomatoes, just as we saw from the command line. Okay, any questions? No questions? No? All right. And so now that we have peeled off, so to speak, that first row from our CSV file, uh, the header row, what we are left with are all the data containing rows. And so we wanna bring this in, from disk ultimately into our data structure. And so up above, I said, I call it the rows and the rows is ultimately gonna be a two dimensional array. A two dimensional array, again, is implemented under the covers as a one dimensional array where each position is stored an object which itself is an array. And so as I go through that iterator, I ask the CSV reader, get me the next row, get me the next row, get me the next row. And each time I do that, it's gonna populate an array with the contents of that particular row. And so in this iteration block, I have my for loop as my iteration. And for each um, iteration inside the block, we have this so-called dummy variable called row. And that dummy variable row is gonna be assigned the particular array 
uh, that is returned from each row uh, of the CSV reader. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? Okay. So each time I get an entry, a row, I'm gonna append it to the rows, plural, and that's gonna be our two dimensional uh, array. Okay. So let's go ahead over that iterator and I have debug uh, set to false. So I don't print out the rows there, but if we wanted to prove it to ourselves, let me go ahead, set debug equal to true. Oops, if I can spell that right. And I need to rerun and that's another thing to watch out for. If you change something in a cell that's earlier in your program in the notebook, you have to go back to that cell and rerun it. So if I had a, um, wanted to import a new library like Seaborn and use it later on, it's going to give you an error message saying, I don't know what that is because you haven't updated your run. It doesn't exist at that juncture. So each time you make a change to your notebook, you have to go back and execute that code uh, for that change to be reflected in the runtime image in memory representation uh, for your notebook. Okay, so we change debug to true. And then just for good measure, I'm gonna step through all of these um, previous uh, statements, header. And then we go through the iterator. And now debug is set to true. And why did it not do that? Let's see. Debug true. If debug worked on my machine last night. Famous last words, right? Um, Let's see, why did that not work? That should have worked. Oh, it shouldn't matter. Let's try that, thank you. Debug true, ba ba ba. Hmm, that's weird. Go figure. Let me try this. It's the same. Let me save it. Save. Let's try that. Oh, that's odd. So that's going to kill my, my whole, that's weird. Huh. All right, let me just do that so I can show you my point and I'll fix it later. It worked last night on my uh, desktop. That's weird. That's really weird. Huh. All right, so anyways, I promise you it works. <laughs> so, um, so the rows, um, if debug, that's supposed to work. Let's see, save. Let's try that. Go figure. That's really strange. Let me try this. Um, Debug, new cell, if, let me just copy that, see. Save, it's true. That's strange. Huh, it's probably right in front of, did I spell it right, D-E-B-U-G. Oh, that's weird. That's really weird. Huh. Like literally last night. Huh. That's weird. Anyone see it? No. It's indented. There's the block. Huh. Let me try one thing. Save. That's weird. I shouldn't need to print it. Oh, you know what? I wonder if I have a different Python version on my laptop versus my desktop at home. The rows. Let's do that. Save. I shouldn't need to print. It should just, yeah. 
Oh, that's interesting. It's not even formatted. All right. So that being said, I'll debug, uh, no pun intended, uh, why that's not working. It probably has to do with a mismatch in default behavior associated with the Python version on my desktop at home versus my laptop here. I take my Python um, notebooks, Jupyter notebooks, and I save them on my Dropbox. So then what I do the night before, I just pick it back up here, but I'm using a different version of Jupyter, I've rather a different version of Python here. On my desktop at home, I use the most current version of Python. On my laptop, I can't remember what version of Python I'm using. So maybe there's some nuanced difference in the behavior. So I apologize for that. Um, on my Python kernel for my notebook at home, this version works. Um, okay, so that being the case, um, you have a debug statement. You can verify uh, to yourself that uh, the rows, that data structure, that two-dimensional array um, that you've populated with the data containing entries from your CSV file, that it has what you think it has. Okay. All right. Any questions? No? All right. And so the next thing is I take my um, Python array and I convert it to a NumPy array. Uh, because I'm interested in using the NumPy slicing, just because it looks more visually pleasing, at least to me. Um, you don't have to do it that way. So I go ahead and I call NP array and I give it uh, a reference to that 2D array, the rows, and it goes through, looks at the dimensions, and then it populates uh, the NumPy version of that Python array from it, does that for you. And so oftentimes when you're dealing, especially with broadcast. Now, broadcasting is the term for when you take a data structure and you want to assign it to another data structure in memory. And so when you're doing a slice, uh, you take that sliced information, the columns from the data containing portion of uh, your all data from the CSV that we've read into memory, and you broadcast it to another array um, in order uh, to use it uh, for your calculations, as well as your visualizations. And so a lot of errors have to do with the shape of the thing that you sliced not being compatible uh, with the data structure to which you're broadcasting that information. And so for that reason, it's very useful when you have some data structure uh, to uh, print out the shape. Now, shape is an attribute or a piece of information associated with an object more generally, um, for NumPy arrays, you have this shape attribute. And what it tells you is the row count and the column count in that order in a tuple or a parenthesized um, comma separated list. Uh, so um, here we know that it has 108 rows and it has five columns. And that makes sense because we have four food items. Those are the four of the five columns. And that date was that first uh, column. Okay, any questions? And so whenever ultimately you're going to do a slice and a broadcast, it's very useful to kind of remind yourself um, what that shape is. So if something goes wrong, you say, aha, uh, that's why um, I got this broadcast error. Okay. Any questions? No? All right. Set the time. So now we go ahead, and now that we know what the shape is, uh, we go ahead and we record that shape specifically the row count, and we're just calling that the number of measurements because we're going to need that later on. Okay, so next thing we do is we build individual vectors, and I know it's an array. It's just a habit of mine. Um, I call it a vector. Um, it's a 1D array, and we populate a bunch of vectors or 1D arrays uh, from the sliced columns uh, for the data that we want uh, from our consolidated data um, that we've converted to a NumPy array. And so here, when we convert it to a NumPy array, I call it NumPy the rows, which is the NumPy version of the, the rows uh, array, uh, 2D array. And we slice out the date column. And up above, we have a global variable for the date column, which was zero. And we slice out the broccoli prices. We slice out the chuck prices, the spaghetti prices, and the tomato prices. Now recall, I said that when these um, floating point numbers, these data, these real valued uh, entries are read out of CSV, it's giving you the string version, but you want the numeral or the numeric version. And so to do that, and this is not the only way to do it, um, you call your NumPy array, and then you call AS type. You're changing the type. 
And so implicitly, it'll take that string if it's 1.6 and convert it uh, to the floating point number 1.6. That's really, really important because when you do the visualizations, these visualization APIs are expecting numbers and not strings. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? And so here, each time I slice out an array and I do the broadcast uh, to a vector, Brock prices, et cetera, I then redefine it as a floating point number for each one of those slices that I've broadcast to another array. Okay, any questions? No? All right. And so I do that for each item and I set this cursor because I was gonna do a different approach using zip and other stuff, but I thought I'd simplify it um, in this fashion. Using zip is not incorrect. Uh, it's just a different way of doing it. Now, certainly here, I take the approach of going through each position in these food item price arrays. And then I add them using an iterator um, in a for loop, right? Uh, I do iteration uh, using a for uh, loop. Um, there's another way to do it. You could choose to slice out um, each of those rows uh, an array uh, for the food items. And so you slice across for each row those food item prices and do your sum for SMBI index that way. Right. I've chosen to do it this way because in my mind, it seemed like it was more straightforward in terms of the explanation in class. But certainly this isn't the only way uh, that one could solve this. So I go ahead and I do those slices. And as a result, I have four arrays, broccoli prices, chuck prices, spaghetti prices, and tomato prices. And the rank of each one of those vectors is gonna be 108 because I have nine months, um, nine years rather times 12 months worth of data for 108 total measurements. Okay, so let me go past this debug that doesn't work, you know, figure out why that's the case on my laptop, uh, but not on my desktop. So then the next thing I do is I create a data structure uh, for the SMB index prices. And by the specification of the assignment, the SMB was a simple statistic. It's just the sum of the respective measurements for each one of the food items. Now, in this case, I pre-populate an array, pre-allocate an array, a NumPy array uh, with zeros. And the reason I did that in this particular case has to do with performance considerations. Every time you have a data structure, if you're going to use it very frequently or so-called touch it very frequently, it's really important to pre-allocate it because you don't want to rely on dynamic allocation because that'll slow down your computation. And so I've chosen for that reason to pre-allocate it. And then later on, when I set the values, um, I set the, I access this array uh, that I've allocated globally. So I just wanted to show you an example of these sort of software engineering considerations. Another thing you could have done is created an empty array, and then each time you calculate the SMBI or the SMB index for that reporting period, you could just append to that empty array and you get the same result. Now, the difference is pre-allocation, it's just a reference to something in memory. If you have to append, you now have to grow or allocate new memory and then add it. And that can slow you down tremendously if you're dealing with very large data sets. Okay. Any questions about this? That makes sense? No? All right. So we go ahead and we pre-allocate our array. And now we iterate. And we know that there are num measurements, many measurements, and we measured that uh, from the array after we read it into memory. And that's a nice thing to do is to calculate your measurements, not just hard code it. Because when you calculate it, if we had reporting periods, for example, that instead of nine years was 18 years, this would automatically adjust to the size of the CSV file. And so that's another really good engineering practice is to calculate your measurements or your quantities over which you inter iterate rather than just hard coding it. Because the hard coding won't work or you'll have what's called a Byzantine error. If your entries were for 18 years instead of nine years, you'd only pull out the first nine years worth of measurements, right? Which would be incorrect. Okay, any questions? No? All right. So we go ahead in our iteration block, uh, we range from zero to num measurements. And we can do that because with range, the semantics are, it starts with that starting um, index zero, and it goes to that second index num measurements, but it subtracts one. And that works perfectly for arrays and access in Python because array access is zeros based. If we were doing things like counting, like we want to display one or two, then we'd have to take num measurements and add one and start from one 
in order to accommodate that. So sometimes you have to tinker with this range command um, in order, uh, depending on what your program is accomplishing. Okay, so we iterate from zero to num measurements minus one. And on each iteration of this for loop, uh, i is gonna be set to an integer zero, then the next iteration one, two, three, and so forth. And so we use that to access that respective location in our vector SMBI prices. And we're gonna set it to the result of summing for that particular measurement, the ith measurement, that position from the vectors containing the food item prices. Okay, any questions? That makes sense. Yeah. All right. So we go ahead and we do that. And again, I know the, the debug isn't working for some reason on my laptop. Oops. Brock, what did I Let's see? Oh, you know what? Let me comment that out. I was going to use a zip. Um, didn't mean to have this propagate forward. Okay. And so originally I was gonna use zip and I was gonna set a variable for each one of the individual prices and do some other fancier stuff, but I opted not to do that. So that particular if block for the debug is an artifact from what I was gonna do originally. So we go ahead and now at this juncture, we have F SMBI prices as another vector and each entry is the sum of um, each of those food items, those four food items, broccoli, chuck, spaghetti, and tomato. So now we bring up a canvas, uh, we call that figure one, and we're gonna go ahead and produce a line plot. Uh, we have a line for five items in this case, each food price, um, as well as the SMB index. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's run that. And here, let me blow that up. We see our plots. We have in the blue, the SMB index. Uh, we have the purple, the chuck, uh, the tomato is red. Um, the green is broccoli and light blue with that magenta. Magenta is spaghetti. Okay. And so now we're going to do the histogram visualization. And for this histogram visualization, uh, we're going to slice up our canvas. We call this canvas figure two. Uh, and we're going to do a two by two slice uh, in each one of the quadrants resulting. Uh, we're going to place the histogram uh, for each of the food items. Uh, we have a global title, super title um, up above. And then we have a title for each one of the particular histogram uh, subplots. And so we do that and it doesn't look very good. I did that on purpose. Uh, we have five bins uh, for the histogram. Uh, so I don't like that. So I'm gonna change it. And rather than changing it in a lot of places, I'm gonna go up above and change histogram bins uh, to 15 uh, from five. Now, if I went back down and I went ahead and I said, let me rerun uh, the histogram plot, you'll notice it's the same as it was before. I didn't pick up that change because I haven't executed that cell in my um, notebook that contains that update. And so I have to go back to that cell and I have to run it. And yeah, I didn't try this, let me try that. Uh, if I go back and I go ahead to the slice, we see now that it's updated, right? And so each time you make a change to a cell, if you want it to be reflected in the place where you use it, you have to rerun uh, that code in that particular cell. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? Okay, in a debugger, you would change it, you'd save it, and then you'd run the debugger again from scratch. Uh, but the notebook affords you the ability uh, to go back and forth, um, which is kind of nice when you're developing code, as well as when you're trying to visualize things. Okay, so now we did that. And let's go ahead, uh, for good measure, let's separately uh, plot the histogram for the SMB uh, index. Now, I've done that with uh, fig size. At home, I have a 30 inch monitor. And so the browser will rescale things um, based on your screen real estate. And so here I've set the figure size specifically uh, just so that it looks uh, a little bit nicer. And so this is the distribution for the SMB index. And in the two by two slice, we have the distributions for each one of the food items respectively. Now, some of the observations that one might make, and we have 15 minutes left, is the dispersion or the spread along the horizontal axis along which we have probability mass. Now, the important thing to really, really remember in your analyses is when you look at the horizontal axis, you have the prices, but look at the scale, right? The scale is different 
And the reason for that is when it draws the histogram, it's trying to make it look nice for you. So it wants to make it big. So it'll sometimes blow up the scale, make it bigger, sometimes shrink it down uh, in order to make it look nice. If you wanted to make a comparison between two things on the same scale, you might want to specifically set the scale so that every time you plot a histogram, for example, the horizontal axis goes from zero because it's dollars to say, I don't know, a um, hundred for a hundred dollars. That way, whenever you compute a histogram, it'll show you where that is. And then when you compare the dispersions, uh, you can see it visually on equal footing. Now you don't have to do that. The main takeaway for this part of our discussion is that you really wanna pay attention to the scale uh, for this horizontal axis. And so here, for example, for broccoli, the middle is about $1.8, $1.80, and the bottom is just a little bit more than $1.50, and it goes up to $2.10. But for the chuck, you'll notice it goes from like uh, $1.75 um, to as high as like, uh, like $5.6, right? That's a wider dispersion. So it's really important if you plot your histograms using um, the automatic scaling that it does for you to pay close attention uh, to these values between the minimum and the maximum bin edges. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? Okay. And so here we have the SMB index. It has a broad range and now let's go down and compute some of our summary statistics. We have uh, the sample mean, or the mean, I shouldn't say sample mean, we haven't talked about that term yet. And for that, we're gonna go to the statistics library or module in Python. And so we're gonna reuse those vectors that we had, the same vectors we used uh, to plot our visualizations, both the line plots and the histograms. Uh, here, we call them mu and STD for standard deviation. Uh, we call mean from the statistics library and standard deviation from the statistics library. Now that's not the only way you can do it. There are other mean and standard deviation um, API calls. You could compute the variance and take the square root. You could write the program yourself to do it, right? They're all equivalent. Um, I'm just showing you from the statistics library here. So I go ahead and I plot the, and I ca calculate these, and then I do a formatted print, right? So let me go ahead. And it tells me that the mean mu for each of the food items are what they are. And the standard deviation, the square of which is the variance, uh, is uh, the um, dispersion for each one of the food items. I throw in um, the SMBI just for good measure. And one of the things we can see is that um, Chuck has the largest mean, right? The largest central value. And then if we look at dispersion, it looks like, um, SMBI has the largest dispersion, but for individual food items, the largest standard deviation is also Chuck. So Chuck both has the largest center as well as the widest dispersion, okay? And SMBI, spaghetti meatball index, we know that we're adding, and therefore, if Chuck has the larger values and larger dispersion, SMBI is gonna depend more, its changes are gonna depend more on Chuck. But what if we didn't know that? right? Um, that's where the correlation coefficient comes into play. And so here uh, we compute correlation coefficients, rho, and I construct the raw correlation coefficient, which is just a matrix, a two by two, uh, with uh, broccoli and chuck, broccoli and spaghetti, and so forth. And see, so these are all of the pairings of one food item type uh, with another. And so I do that, and I call rho to mimic uh, the theory and this underscore after that, I have BC. So rho underscore BC would be the correlation between broccoli and chop. So I just use that naming scheme. When we go to data frames, it'll be a lot easier. Uh, you can do it more than just pairwise uh, as we do with this API. And we'll talk about that um, in probably another week um, or so of time. So I compute these and then of course, I wanna know what that relationship is, that linkage uh, between SMBI and um, each of the food items. And the reason for doing that is because the question I'm trying to answer there or depict is um, which food item is the SMBI um, most dependent on, right? Now, certainly if Chuck is most expensive, then that's gonna dominate um, the SMBI price. 
Uh, but if you didn't know that, it's something you have to analyze, something you have to calculate. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? Yeah, all right. So let's go ahead and do all these correlations. And let's go ahead and do our formatted print. And for the individual food prices, this tells us what the linkage is uh, between the food prices. And so for this, we look for the largest magnitude. Again, correlation can be positive or negative, and that just tells you um, the direction of this linkage. What we're looking for is the magnitude, right? And so here we see minus 48, that's the largest magnitude, uh, and that's row um, spaghetti, tomato. So spaghetti and tomato are most closely linked to one another. Now, of course, that's valuable information because if this relationship is very strong, then if you saw spaghetti go up, that means you're gonna see the other one, uh, tomato, go down, okay? All right, any questions? No? And you could also then scroll up to the graph and actually verify that. You'll see here, let me scroll up really quickly, that, oops, ah, there we go. If spaghetti, which is cyan, um, and tomato, which is the red, tomato goes up, we see a little bump here, right around hmm, 36 or 35 or so. And you'll notice the cyan spaghetti, it goes down, right? So there's a negative correlation there. A unit step increase in one corresponds to a unit step decrease in the other. So you can see it visually, but you can also numerically calculate that. All right, any questions? Does that make sense? All right, so now if we look at the SMB index in Chuck, um, I'm sorry, the SMB index uh, for its correlation with individual food prices, we have row of, um, let's see, uh, tomato uh, of um, Chuck with SMB. So the correlation between Chuck and SMB is 0.88. That's a really strong correlation. Because remember, our correlation ranges in the interval from negative one to positive one, where zero means no correlation, negative one means a perfect um, negative correlation, positive one means a perfect positive correlation. So here, 0.88, that's a very strong correlation between Chuck and SMB index. And so with that, okay, let's go back to the graph and let's convince ourselves. So here we have Chuck, which is the, is that pink or purple? <laughs> I have no idea. Whatever, magenta, magenta is a purple red, right? Magenta, magenta. Um, because I don't remember what color I specified. So the magenta, if we look at that, we see here um, the chuck. It kind of goes up like there around the 20th measurement. And we see um, SMBI also goes up. Now, it makes sense that if it's just the price, which is the sum, that that particular item, which has the largest value, is going to have the biggest contribution to that sum. But again, if you didn't know that inherently, it's something you have to calculate, something you see from the graph. So one of the things you could do is you could look at this line graph and say, hmm, where do I think there's a dependence? And then you go ahead and you do your analytical calculations and you see, okay, the top two here uh, that dictates the price of the spaghetti meatball index, we have Chuck as number one with 0.88 and change, and we have tomato as number two, 0.75 and change. And the others are, are lower. Okay. Any questions? And again, I stress, this is linear dependence. Now, if I wanted to, um, since we have like about six or seven minutes, we could also verify this with a scatter plot. And we take the point cloud, we look at the direction in which it slopes. And so our correlation tells us that SMB index is most closely influenced or most strongly influenced uh, by Chuck and then by tomato. Um, if we go ahead and produce a scatter plot, uh, let's say figure ba, 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 figure five. Let's call it figure five. Um, PLT figure five. And then we're going to say scatter, no, PLT scatter. And we're going to give it on horizontal axis. Let's give it, um, it's positive. So let's give it um, Chuck, uh, Chuck prices and SMBI prices. Hopefully I use the right names, uh, Chuck prices um, and SMBI, uh, SMBI prices. Okay, 
So let's go ahead and run this. And we see this cigar shape here, right? We have uh, Chuck along the horizontal axis. We have SMBI along the vertical axis. It's a very narrow point cloud. And if you drew an ellipse around it, it would be a very eccentric ellipse and it's sloped upwards, right? Does that make sense? Let's take a look at a different association. Uh, we had, um, how about spaghetti and SMB, right? Let's do that. So plot uh, figure six, a different canvas. And we'll say plot scatter um, between, what do we call it? Uh, spag, spag, I think it was spag prices. Spag prices, yeah. Um, spag prices, um, SMBI, SMBI prices. And we go ahead and do that. Oops, let me put that back to normal size and run that. And we notice this ellipse is not as eccentric. It's kind of more football shaped and not elongated like a cigar, like the first plot. But if we were to plot a best fit line, it's sloping downward, but not so steeply downward. Does that make sense? Any questions? No? Now, some other things uh, to observe is that you'll notice with the scatter plot, you kind of have this set of values. You lose the um, concept of time here, right? You're just looking at the co-occurrence of values, and you're looking at the gross level shapes of this uh, point cloud, uh, this ellipse or cigar shape, if you want to call it that. With the histogram, yes, you're visualizing the distribution. You lose all concept of structure, right? It'll give you the distribution, but you can't really say, does something change in time, right? Um, one of the things you could do is you could plot the values. You could also plot the change in values from one measurement to the next measurement in time. That derivative will tell you something uh, different from something like this histogram. So histogram damages time, but the good news is it gives you information about dispersion in the central tendency, namely the center of mass, our mean. Okay, and the line plot, of course, it gives you that temporal behavior. And so you could use the raw value, you could use derivatives, you could use second derivative to tell you the turning point when it uh, pivots from decreasing to increasing, increasing to decreasing, and all sorts of other transformations. Okay, and so the main takeaway is the mind space of what you do to the data structures, your algorithm. Uh, you can look at distributions with a histogram. Uh, you can calculate uh, the linkage, linear linkage uh, with correlation. Um, and you can also uh, verify that with the scatter plot and a lot of other analyses that we haven't yet gotten to. Okay, any questions about this? Does that make, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. So I had to create all the functioning to get it. Oh my gosh. Lined up. Okay. Ah. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, so I think I might have had a note somewhere. Yes, yes. Range. Um, if you specify this range option, um, uh, it will set that range and tell um, matplotlib do not rescale the axes when you do the histogram, right? And so let me go ahead and set that. Um, and I'm gonna violate my own practice. And then I like to have range equals something. Oh, let me not violate it. Um, hist range equals um, 0, 0.0 to 12.0. I just made those numbers up. And so range is equal to hist range. So that way I can change it um, in one place. Um, uh, let's see, copy, paste, copy and paste, and you get one too, copy and paste, there we go. And so with that, it registers these on the same scale, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and run this, see what it looks like. So this is what it looked like before, and we noticed that um, the min and the max bin edges are different. So let's go ahead and run that. And we'll notice here, now it's sort of taken it and now scrunched it all in 
but the min and max are now between zero and 12. That's a bad range I've chosen. Let's change that um, because the prices don't go that high to $12. Uh, let's change the range to say $5 on the high side. So if we do that, save, and we go ahead and re redo it. Now that it's on the same range, we can more easily see that Chuck has a larger dispersion than say spaghetti, right? It's uh, probability mass is spread over a larger um, set of the support set uh, than uh, spaghetti does. So that's one way to do it. Uh, you could also um, plot these histograms on the same figure, right? So then you'd have to worry about um, uh, making the histograms different colors. And there are people that do that too. And then some will go so far as to, instead of plotting the bars, they'll plot the envelope. So with that, you'll have like, for example, if this were zero to $5 and spaghetti would be kind of like this. And then in another color, you'd have broccoli since chalk is just one color. And then you'd have uh, Chuck would be kind of out here. I'll say, you know, I'll just do it that way. And then tomato would be kind of like this. I just drew them kind of skewed and not the actual values on the graph on the screen. But another thing you could do is just draw the envelope um, and not the bars and have them in different colors and you can see the relationship among them. So lots and lots of different options. Um, the easy sort of low hanging fruit uh, is to just use that option called range equals. And at least at a minimum, if you select it the right way, you can easily see what that relationship is in terms of the location. Um, this is over two, this is over like 1.3. This one tomato is over like two and Chuck is over about 380 or so. Right, you can see the location and the scale, the the dispersion relative to one another quite easily. Okay. Any other questions? No. All right. Uh, so that's all I had today. I threw in the scatter plot. Ooh, I'm over. I am so sorry about that. We're about three minutes over. All right. So let's end there. I'll see you all on Friday.